All right. Hello, everyone. OK, so uh, we're going to take a little bit of a, a different focus. Uh, sticking in the video game theme, I want to give you, uh, I, we only have a short period of time, but we have lots of time for questions and answers and a deeper dive later. So with that, let me start. Um, when I was uh, confronted with trying to talk about video games and neuroscience and cognitive enhancement in 15 minutes, I realized that I couldn't just dive right into video games. I needed to give it a little bit of context, at least from my perspective, why it's interesting. This is a major goal that I've had throughout my entire scientific career and a focus of my lab on how we can build approaches to enhance our cognitive abilities. And by that we mean the broad array of skills that allow us to process information from perception to attention to memory, decision making, emotional regulation in both people that are healthy and impaired. From the healthy point of view, it is, or at least should be, a core mission of our education system, right? Not just the transfer of information and content, but actually improving how we process information. And from the impaired point of view, it's the entire foundation of the mental health care system. All the neurological and psychiatric diseases, most of them, that have impairments in these higher order abilities. How do we enhance them? And this is a global challenge with a massive win if we figure out how to do this. I'm just going to give you a quick picture. It's sort of a sad picture of our current state of affairs when it comes to enhancing cognition. I'm going to give this from the medical perspective, being a neurologist. But the same story, if we had enough time, could be told for, told for education. So if you're an older adult and you have a decline in your memory, cognitive abilities, this uh, phenomenon of showing up at the refrigerator only to have no idea what you're doing there, and don't be concerned if, if you've experienced this, everyone does. But if it does happen more frequently and you wind up in a doctor's office, even at the best medical centers in the world, what would happen? Well, the first thing is that we'd likely to have a very poor idea of what's going on in your brain to lead to these changes. Not taking advantage of the explosion of functional imaging tools that we've had over the last decade, you're likely not to get any of that. We will not really know exactly what is happening here that's leading to that behavioral change. If we do treat you, it's likely going to be poorly targeted. Our current medications uh, usually come in this format, and um, they don't have to, but they usually are drugs. And uh, despite positive effects, they are very uh, poorly targeted. They're blunt instruments. They act on neurotransmitter systems, but they don't act on the underlying computational unit of the brain, which is the neural network. And therefore, we have to increase doses very high to get effects, and we get side effects. And a lot of what we do as physicians is treat those side effects that are caused by the uh, very treatments that we give. They're also non-personalized. The prescriptive information is based on large population data, not taking into account the individual differences and the heterogeneity of those populations. They're often unimodal, our prescriptions, right? So you get this single drug to help how your brain operates, not looking frequently at how they interact with other things that might be helpful, like physical exercise, which a lar large literature exists showing that it improves the health of the brain. And they're also open loop. And that's a really important point in the context of video games. What does it mean to be open loop? Well, it's easy to describe it for closed loop. So a closed loop is when you intervene in some way, record the impact, and then use that data to guide a reapplication, hopefully with as short a time as possible creating a closed feedback loop. And we know, without a doubt, that this is the strongest way to influence any system, whether it be physical or biological. Our medical system, and I might go to say that our education system, is really very open loop. So for medicine, you get this drug, you go home, you have a subjective impression of the effects and side effects, you go back to your doctor, it might be months later, they use this information, but really in a non-empirically based way, then make an adjustment up or down. And you continue this very open loop cycle. This is not how you change a system, and I would say that this approach is just not good enough. And I don't feel quite that strongly about drugs in general. That's not really the point. The point is that our current toolbox that we use to treat conditions of cognition, um, even in the healthy way, are really lacking in all these domains. And so we have a strong goal, or we all should, to build approaches that are targeted, personalized, multimodal, and closed loop. And hopefully someday we'll have a drug that cures Alzheimer's disease and it'll be a term that drifts into non-existence. But until that happens, we need this approach to strengthen how our brains function so that we can at least resist pathology when it presents itself and act and interact in the world in an optimal way uh, even when we're healthy. How do we do that? I sort of stepped back around six years ago and looked at the landscape of approaches that we can enhance cognition. I'm not going to go through this right now. It's a, a longer discussion. But I became very interested in these video games. Um, and so that's, the, that's now how I want to segue over to that and show how it relates to what I just presented. 
as you probably most certainly know, video games are pretty much ubiquitous now. Um, the ESA uh, reports every year, I was just looking at it this morning, the, uh, the 2014 report, you know, we pretty much have balanced male, female. Uh, the average age of a gamer is over 30, and it's not just younger gamers like myself becoming older. They're targeting different populations. The categories have increased. The size of the industry from a financial point of view is bigger than the music and the uh, movie industry, much to the shock of many people. So clearly we have a really powerful interactive tool here that guides behavior. We know that, that's obvious. But the question is, does, can it have positive impact? I found this quote that it's interesting that I want to share from you from the early days of video game Time Magazine. Video games are just another manifestation of human mania, our enduring quality of going relentlessly after absolutely pointless goals. <laughs> 1982. Now, some people, when I give talks, I, th I see them like nodding. You know, it's not really my point. I, I personally don't believe this, but you know, this is in the mindset of a lot of people. I was just actually reading a, an article this morning on Minecraft where this same concept was up that their kids are just wasting their time. This is pointless. Um, I was inspired uh, by work, and you, you heard this uh, uh, scientist mention Daphne Bevelet and work which she did with Sean Green, really launching a field in, in 2003 with a Nature paper that showed that these games, a lot of the games that, established, that have the most controversy because of their violent content, actually improve cognitive abilities in the young adults that play them. And you see that sort of if you compare players to non-players, and you also see that if you take naive uh, uh, kids and have them play, you see the same type of effects when you compare it to a control group, a different video game. And uh, Daphne Bevelet had a paper just in PNAS, I think this week or last week, again showing how this improves perceptual templates and other aspects of why this improves cognition. And we, you know, we feel that we can now uh, build an entire field, and we see this around the world, that all these different objectives are looking at, you know, not just the data that I showed you now, but other ways to make video games impactful. I'm most interested in health and education. And you could see that there are many titles, you already heard about some of them like Remission, that act and have been shown to be both commercially successful and also push the needle in these domains. But what's most interesting to me is that health and education, as I started the talk, the crossroads of them is cognition. This is where there's a tremendous amount of overlap and I think a really big win. And if we think about video games from the point of view as something that is an engine to harness this phenomenon of our brain, plasticity, that a brain can modify itself at every level of resolution, structure, function, chemistry, all in response to targeted interactions with the environment. That is what was really exciting to me when I started my research in this six years ago. And I just want to give you a little look at what we're doing what started as a challenge to my lab, can we build a custom designed video game where we distill the active in ingredients from consumer games but target them to deficits in populations and then test them very carefully in the lab along with neural recordings to understand mechanism. And so we built this game called NeuroRacer with friends of mine that worked at George Lucas's video game company LucasArts, built the game. Just a little bit about what's under the hood. There's two tasks going on here, a driving task and a sign task. And then we use adaptive staircase algorithms that are baked into the game engine that allow the game in real time to adjust and scale its difficulty in an appropriate way to your performance. And that's like the ideal way to really target a game so it's not too hard or too easy. And I think what we'll learn is the ultimate way to really harness that plasticity. And then we use reward cycles at different time scales from immediate to mid to long reward scales to have people be engaged and immersed in the gameplay. And then we can do a study. And I'm just going to give you a snapshot of some data from a paper we had last year where we show that we can use the video game behaviorally and neurally as a diagnostic tool and then as an intervention. So what you're looking at here is how you multitask on the game, meaning how you do on the sign task when you do it alone compared to when you're also driving. A zero percent would mean that you do perfectly. And if you ask a 20-year-old, and there might be 20-year-olds in, in this room, and I ask them many times how they do, they think they will do perfectly because they believe they are multitasking masters. But what we find that's not true. We see around a 27% drop in performance on these two tasks. And we already know that older adults are going to have difficulty with this because we've published dozens of papers on it. But what we see is that it's actually every year of life that you have an increased uh, difficulty in performing. So you could see that you could use a game in a very careful way to look behaviorally between different populations. Actually, the biggest difference between two adjacent decades of life are 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds. We could then have neural recording. Oh, sorry. I, 
put in another little piece of new data here that you could see eight to 12 year olds sort of around the 35 year old level. So this is a skill that increases and then decreases. We can also develop the game, we put this real burden on our game design team, that we could record neural activity during gameplay. So this is recordings with 64 channel EEG. We could also do this game and have done it inside the MRI scanner and see what happens in the brain at the most challenging part of the game when you're driving along and a sign flashes up. What we see is that there's a burst of activity from the prefrontal cortex in a low frequency known as midline frontal theta. And this is the engagement of the most evolved part of our brain that's involved in this type of cognitive control. And if we look at some EEG data here, what you're looking at is a topography looking down on a 20 year, average 20 year old's brain. The nose is pointing up, the ears are to the side. And you can see at the scale, the power scale there, there's this yellow burst. This occurs within a third of a second after a sign pops up. You just get this really rapid engagement of the prefrontal cortex looking at this metric that then just levels off by the end of the second. If if you look at 70 year olds is what you say. So there's a burst there, right? But you know, it's only uh, halfway up the scale. So we could use this both diagnostically on the behavior and the neural end. What about as a training tool? So we had our older adults, this is a collaboration with Apple back in the day, we distributed these laptops around the Bay Area to older adults that played this for 12 hours, one hour a day, three days a week for a month at home. Their data went right into a Dropbox account, right to our lab. We can see them playing and guide and judge their compliance. And then we bring them back and see what happens in their brains, what happens in their performance on the game, and what happens in terms of other cognitive skills. And this is what we find. So their ability to multitask on the game really improves dramatically, more, more so than we expected, and actually more than 20-year-olds that were playing the game on a single visit. But what's really exciting to us is this change in how their brain is activated right at the most challenging point of the game, rapid, within a third of a second. We do not believe this is a strategic change, but real functional plasticity in how these resources are brought online to deal with this challenge. If you just look at the multitasking skill on the game, and you bring these people back six months after not playing the game, it has not dropped significantly. So it actually sustains itself. What a lot of people find most exciting is that other skills that were not directly targeted in the game but fall under that umbrella of cognitive control, like working memory for faces for brief periods of time or attention span vigilance in a very impoverished environment to a rare target, also improve. Another thing we learned is that it's only, um, this improvement occurs only in those older adults that are playing this game in the multitasking version. So another one of our control groups was an active control that played NeuroRacer, but single task mode. Sign and then driving, never at the same time. They showed none of the neural changes, none of the improvement on these other tasks. So from this, we basically uh, are starting to create the underlying principles, the mechanisms of how you bridge, right? It's not a magic trick. You can't go from here to there by some mysterious process. If something is going to lead to transfer to another skill, there must be an underlying neural mechanism that bridges that. And we can see that in the data that those participants that show the most change in the neural measure on the game itself show the most transfer benefits to the other untrained attention task and the most sustained benefits six months later. So starting to build the design principles that go into creating a game to have meaningful and sustainable effects. And we were fortunate that this was published in Nature last year with these main conclusions that adaptive training of the interference processing, remember because our control group that did not have the interference challenge did not show these changes, enhances cognitive control in older adults and these improvements are associated with engagement of the prefrontal cortical network. So this was incredibly exciting. This was a four years of research following a year of game design. And you could see that Nature put this a really exciting and intimidating title of Game Changer on the journal, which as, as exciting that is for a laboratory, it actually tortured me because it led to months of messaging globally to the media that I'm not, we don't think that this game is a game changer. I'm very excited about it. You know, we, we built it, we designed it, we tested it, but what I hope if there is a game changer here, that it's you can build carefully, interacting with professionals from the industry that know how to do this, work together, create something that targets a known deficit in a population, and then validate it carefully in a controlled study with neural measures to look at outcomes and understand mechanism. And if that methodology becomes more widespread, then maybe we will see a game changer and see the ability to really carefully validate these tools as interventions and diagnostics. So that's what I hope. 
I just want to just give you a picture of what happens after that. Well, we learned very well that you cannot build a product in an academic laboratory, right? We're constantly asked, thousands of emails. We want NeuroRacer. Well, NeuroRacer is on an operating system that's out of date. We don't have tech support. It's not scalable in any way. It's an experiment. So, but we want to, you know, we, we, we started with the discovery of these vulnerabilities in the aging brain. We invented something. We built that game. How do we then bring it into people's lives so it can have impact? Now, I do want to point out that as excited we are about that data, it's a signal. I never use the data from NeuroRacer as a prescriptive advice to large populations that I speak to. It's a signal that there's something here, that we found something that should encourage us to do the type of large-scale studies that you need to look for real-world transfer, to look for clinical clinical impact. It in itself does not do that. No study does that alone. It sets up, it needs to be reproduced, and it needs to be done in different populations at a larger scale. And maybe they wouldn't also do neural recordings, right? You have to give up some of the deep dive if you want to look for larger scale studies. So once you move out of the lab, and I help co-found a company called Achille Interactive Labs that I'm excited about for several reasons. First of all, the folks from LucasArts now work full time for here. So we have triple A video game designers that are building the games along with scientists to try to figure out how do you take the design principles that we figured out in our paper, feedback, adaptivity, interference. How do you then bring that into a medium that people really engage in and they will do for a long period of time of different age groups, different clinical populations? And one thing we've learned, we personally don't um, build violence into the video games, and I know that's a larger discussion we can have. We think that it's not the active ingredient there, that there are other active ingredients. So what do you do? How do you get people engaged? Art, music, story. And you have to work with professionals in all those domains with scientists to keep the underlying mechanic, the engine intact, but bring on those elements. And so following the patents behind these games is a critical part in order to get it to be sticky to the industry so that they're willing to invest the money to then build these games. So now we have a company, right, that, uh, you know, I keep my day, my day job at UCSF. I'm a professor there. But I could say, well, there's a company that sells this game, so you know that would be a way of sort of passing it along. Unfortunately, the company's not selling anything. There is no product here. The company is now in the research phase. They are an R&D company, essentially. There's no marketing. There's no forward, public-facing um, view of this. All of these studies are going on. I'm just an advisor. I'm not on these studies. It's important for my colleagues to now validate this. And all of these clinical populations are being investigated to see if this video game can hit the same metrics, efficacy with side effect profile that drugs do and the, and the current treatments for these diseases. And the pathway will be for FDA for these. Can we start building video games as prescribable diagnostics and therapeutics? And hopefully we'll see that happen. And it will depend on the data. Only time will tell if these metrics are hit. And if they're not, then you go back and you work on the mechanics and you reapply, just like a drug company would do. Of course, with a much shorter time frame with probably 500 million less dollars than goes into drug development. Another important thing, and I know this is going to come up, are games all good? Well, first of all, that question doesn't make much sense because games are like food or drugs, they're categories and they're complicated and there's individual differences. But it's irresponsible to think that a game only has good. And so the, the, the win of going through a pathway like this is that you also get to think about what might be the side effects. Maybe the side effect is addiction. Maybe we don't want kids with ADD playing games you know, all the time. Maybe they should meet members of the opposite sex and do other things that, uh, that are important for their development. So how do we understand what the side effects are and then how to manage them, just like any other treatment? So these are uh, some of my views uh, on this topic. Thanks for your attention.